Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, welcome. Thanks for being here. Welcome to this uh, first round table uh, entitled The Ecological Agenda. Um, we have four distinguished speakers. Uh, Dr. Yasser Abu Nasser, who will be joining in Skype mode uh, from Cairo. Uh, Dr. Maria Gabriela Trovato, Dr. Naila Al-Al, and Dr. Mehran Madani. Um, so we have four presentations. Uh, I'd like to start off with a brief introduction, and then we'll have the four presentations, and then there's some time for Q&A. Uh, we need to be done by a bit before 6 p.m. Um, I'd like to read the, the short text that is the introduction to this session, just to set a bit the stage. So the ecological agenda. From its simplest definition from biology, ecology is defined as the study of the relationships between organisms and their environment. Within the context of urban design, architecture, and landscape architecture, the ecological agenda becomes an underlying and fundamental platform where these disciplines interact to contribute a unique and significant understanding of the relationship across human systems, natural settings, and man-made environments. The scope of ecological design studies covers a wide range of scales, contexts, and issues ranging from inner city and private green spaces to refugee camps and informal spaces to the growth and expansion of suburban infrastructures in terms of socio-behaviors, community perceptions, and social networks. So the question is, how does the ecological agenda bring forward the importance of understanding relationships and flows within the city and its suburbs while constituting a common platform of interaction between the diverse environmental disciplines. So we'll try to engage in this subject and in these topics. Um, uh, we'll try to fuel a bit the discussion with the uh, four interesting presentations, starting off with Dr. Yasser Abu Nasser. So Yasser is an associate professor at the Department of Landscape Design and Ecosystem Management at AUB. Uh, he adopts a, lang a landscape and environmental approach and ecosystem concerns with uh, community well-being, sorry, and regional planning that mediates ecological and ecosystem concerns with community well-being and livelihood. Uh, Yasser's current research is focused on green infrastructure systems as a planning and design tool for climate change adaptation for urban and regional resilience. Work on green infrastructure is conceptualized as a landscape system that operates at multi-scales, provides multiple benefits, and enhances places of living. He extends this interest into applying community-based landscape approaches to the conservation of cultural and archaeological heritage sites. So this is a, a, a summary of the bio, because the bios are uh, printed and distributed in the full format, if you like to have more info about Yasser. So having said that, we'll start with the first uh, presentation. Yes, sir, are you on? Uh, yes, sir. OK. Um, thank you, Ara. Uh, first, uh, apologies for not being with you in Beirut. Um, I'm talking to you from Cairo. I will try my best to be clear and hopefully not shout into the microphone. Um, so the City Debates 2018 theme, which is the ecological agenda, talks about the connective quality of landscape between the built infrastructural and the natural. Um, and in this presentation, I will be discussing the theme you know, in more depth, but I'll be also using the work from landscape architecture students, the final capstone year, and some of the work that I've been advising also with the urban design during the past four years. I will basically argue that ecology is a language and framework that ought to become a common ground for the disciplines of landscape architecture, architecture and urban design. <clears throat> I'm not going into a fusion, you know, in the sense that we are talking about a single profession, but rather talking about a diversity of professions that can actually collaborate. What's really interesting about, um, you know, the proposed words uh, from, the, from the theme, there are six very powerful, powerful words, and I will just very quickly reflect on them, just for clarity and to remind us, um, you know, about the importance of these words. 
You know, in its simplest form, as the introduction to this session talks about, ecology is the scientific study of organisms and their interactions with their environment. That's very much about what happens in between. Landscape is many ways uh, in this context is the sum of these interactions. It's what we see and what we experience. And infrastructure is, is what is necessary. <clears throat> Here I would categorize roads, rivers, urban water systems, communication systems, all under the same category as something that is necessary for, for existence. And the built is basically the shelter. That's the basic fundamental understanding that we really tend to forget what it means. And then the natural, which is the big question, um, what do we really mean by natural? Is it the pristine, the untouched? Is, it the naive, is this really a naive notion that we really want to think of? Does it exist in the Anthropocene age? And finally, connect. To mere linearity as a simplistic expression of the complex webs of interactions and relations. You know, this might sound like a class of philosophy, but the reason I'm, I'm really trying to uh, bring this forward is that just to remind us a little bit about our fundamental role as designers and, plan and planners. Because these same, same words that are part of this uh, theme that we're talking about have been used by many academicians and practitioners to create some good ideas, but more often have been used to create not so good uh, ideas in other disciplines. So if we take, for example, landscape urbanism, which I'm think all of, I think all of you or many of you have heard about it, there are two claims, and I'm not going to ponder a lot on this, but there are two claims, and this is part of an article written by uh, Thompson in the landscape uh, research. It talks about landscape replaces architecture as the basic building block of cities, which basically means Sorry. that, yes, in sir. other words, you know, Valheim talks a lot about it, that it is the collapse, yes, the radical realignment of traditional boundaries. And it also embraces ecology and complexity. It claims to embrace ecology and complexity. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Really look at what. Hey, Aram. You want to indicate the next and I'm on my slides. Sorry, Aram. So it's slide four. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, excuse me, guys. I'm the first time Bamela remotely. So, Paulo Belcon, you know. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the landscape urbanism claims the collapse between uh, disciplines and it claims also that embraces uh, ecology and complexity. But if you really look at a lot of projects, they all look the same and there is not much diversity and very little uh, ecology. Next. And the same article also asks six questions to landscape urbanists. Can you get out of of the oath from the it, in the sense that landscape urbanism always tells us things are this way rather than ought to be, in, in the sense that you know it is manifesto that we really need to accept. Should the binary go between the rural and the urban? There is no place for wilderness. There's a big question, where are the people? And at the same time, is it too American in the sense that it emerges from very specific American conditions of deindustrialization and so forth that we are, many of us are trying to apply somewhere else. And what does really happen to heritage? These are all very fundamental questions that we will talk about very quickly uh, through the projects from the students. Next, Aram. So, you know, what is ecology? I'm not going to sit and bore you with very big, uh, but, you know, there are big, big things over there when we talk ab about ecology. ecology. We, talk, we talked about organisms and environment. Um, you know, it talks about webs and networks. I'm not going to go into detail because ecology can be a full picture on itself. Uh, I'll try and pick out some very specific words relative to us. So it's a lot about scalar interactions, vertical scalar interactions. It talks a lot about complex interactions, the horizontal, what actually happens between different areas and zones. It's very dynamic and very continuous. It's a lot about processes, and it's very much about networks, system services, and very specifically about energy flows. So in many ways, ecology is that science that really tells us about that relationship and interaction of organisms and the environment and that includes us as, as well. So uh, I think you'll, you know, there might be a 
complex series and ideas, but as we go through the projects, I think some of these ideas will come a little bit uh, clearer. Next. So I have nine projects here that are from uh, the capstone projects from landscape architecture, as well as uh, advising work that I've been doing uh, at the urban design uh, program, as well as one competition that was multidisciplinary. The projects are organized by scale, which is very ecological, let's say, in many ways, because ecology also talks about nested hierarchies in the sense that the whole is much more important the sum is much more important than the different individual parts. And what I will also do is that at the end of our three projects at the, large, at the landscape city scale, three projects at the neighborhood uh, urban scale, and three projects at the site scale, and at the end of the presentation of each of these three, I will compare them through a matrix that I've developed for that comparison. So the first project is uh, by Zane Ruby, who is uh, an urban design student and currently, hopefully, will be graduating this semester. Uh, Zane is trying to look at urban agriculture as a catalyst for post-conflict recovery. And what I'm trying to show here is that, you know, landscape urbanism talked about a lot of good ideas, but I think it misses a lot on how do we actually go and do them. And a lot of what I've been presenting in these projects, and you will notice that, are lot of mixes of tools and methods that come from urban design, from landscape architecture, and from architecture itself. So, uh, so Zane actually uh, is looking at uh, um, urban agriculture as a catalyst for urban uh, post-conflict recovery. And uh, she, she went there, she did a survey of partly of the damage assessment, the survey of agricultural assessment, try to identify potential areas, so that this becomes like the point of return for uh, the original inhabitants who actually worked in agriculture itself. Um, the next, Aram. The second project is a flood pulse, and this was, this was a competition that was submitted by a group of landscape architecture students, urban design, urban planning, and architecture. And this was uh, part of the UN Habitat competition to look at, um, you know, the city of Guasmo Sur in Ecuador and trying to look at the threats of climate change. Um, it's a multi-layered project. There are mangroves, if you notice the green edges, mangroves at the edge, there are informed settlements. And part of the idea is that the uh, municipality was looking at ways to try and move the inhabitants from the coast because of first climate change, rising water surfaces, at the same time flooding due to heavy rains. And what is really interesting in this project is that there's a lot of analysis, ecological analysis and landscape analysis, there's urban mobility analysis, uh, plot architecture, plot analysis, there's even the design of the architecture in units that were made out of uh, upcycling material. So in many ways, it brings a lot of uh, uh, methodologies and tools together to try and develop this. And this was really a true uh, collaborative uh, work between the students who come from different disciplines uh, to come up with a common uh, objective, but each one bringing in their own expertise. Next, Aram. Um, the third project is by Roger Naimi, who actually is an urban design student who graduated in 2015. And uh, Roger went to, uh, he worked in Jezin and looked at uh, zoning, uh, you know, trying to revise or reconsidering zoning in mountain villages. Um, and he, he really adopted a very interesting combination of, of tools as well. Um, in his analysis, he looked at time step analysis of zoning, how it developed. If you look at the four small images on top, and and what is really interesting is that the red area is the developed or the built-up area, and the rest is the different green areas. So the red, orange, and yellow are different um, urbanized areas. And as he moved forward in time, the local interests really came together to expand and reduce, expand the urban areas and reduce um, the agricultural, the cultural landscape that, was, that is there. So Roger adopted, you know, he, he, he used a couple of urban design tools, looking at urban morphologies, looking at architectural heritage and so forth, 
But he also adopted the ELA method developed by uh, Dr. Jan Mahzoumi, the Ecological Landscape Associ Associations. And he also did also interviews looking at the landscape perception of people and what do they think is important. He combined all of these together and really revised uh, the whole zoning, coming up with uh, you know more zones within zoning areas, but there are also very distinct protective areas. He also did regional analysis to actually connect Jersey to the uh, to the larger context. Next, Aram. So if we compare these three projects, I'm not going to repeat uh, what I've done, but what try to tabul tabul tabulate. Uh, all these tools together to try and see, um, you know, how, how how is each project uh, being uh, evolved? And and you know, and I just to say something. I would really like to thank Professor Saliba for, you know, suggesting this idea because that's the first time I really look back at the student projects and reflect on them, and really it really begins to come together and trying to see this fusion of different methodologies and ideas together. Um, I'll just give maybe three seconds for you to look at it, but it's more or less exactly uh, what I've just talked about. So you've got the project name, the analysis scale, proposal scale, and if you notice the analysis works at multiple scale, which is a very ecological idea, then looking at very specific issues. Each project had a very specific issue to, to address, and at the same time choosing the tools to really answer or really respond to that issue. And for each project, there were landscape tools, urban design uh, planning tools, and architectural tools that were actually, uh, uh, you know, used in the project. Next. So if we move towards the more urban uh, district, neighborhood district uh, uh, scale, this is a landscape architecture student who actually chose to work on uh, Ramlet Baida. And she adopted a very interesting approach as well. So if you look at the two top images of, of what is that landform? She, she did a historical analysis of the landform, because originally that area was uh, dunes, basically, so it's sand dunes. And sand dunes are very much <coughs> impacted by wind. They are formed by wind in, in, you know, to a certain extent. So she completed a complete landscape analysis, looking also at vegetation and so forth, looking at the historical evolution of the landscape. But at the same time, she also looked at zoning and plot analysis to look at setbacks. And the purpose of all of this is simply to try and increase the amount of open space, trying to look at you know, increasing, uh, you know, uh, enhancing urban greening in the whole neighborhood to really for the purpose of increasing ecosystem services. And ecosystem services in this context is looking at, uh, you know, ameliorating temperatures, looking at rainfall, uh, and providing some recreational uh, services. Next, Aram. Um, the third, pro the second project at the neighborhood scale is, uh, was by uh, Ruba Dagher, who graduated in 2016, and Ruba, worked on urban agriculture, but at the uh, neighborhood scale, uh, within the neighborhood of Burj Hamoud slash Naba. And she, she employed, uh, what is really very interesting in all of this is that uh, part of the issues of integrating urban agriculture is the transiency of land, in the sense that looking at urban uh, regulations and looking at urban zoning, land doesn't stay fixed, you know, it eventually it's slated to be built. So part of the analysis was looking at the lots and properties and looking at the extent of permanence of these uh, properties. At the same time, uh, doing an agricultural analysis on the soil orientation, what uh, vegetation actually grows over there, and also looking at local practices of urban agriculture, either selling food or actually planting uh, and so forth. And she, at the end of it, she, she employed the GIS analysis in addition to questionnaires and you know face-to-face uh, -face, uh, discussions with people. But she, what she arrived to is uh, is a phased approach where there are certain properties that are some extent permanent, which is very much related to ownership, either the municipality or leftover pieces from planning, in the sense that they are built. so. So permanency is very much related to, uh, you know, the, the use, the size, and its connection to the building regulation and zoning. At the same time, she came up with the idea of 
temporary agriculture and so forth. She looked also at the governance system as well to try and come up with, uh, you know, how could something like this be implemented. Um, and there was a lot of analysis of time, time step, evolution of the landscape and the change of the landscape. Next item. And I see Mahmoud in the audience as well, all the way from Cairo. Um, so Mahmoud graduated in 2015 in, <laughs> with his landscape architecture pro project. But Mahmoud also addressed uh, an important infrastructural uh, question, which is the Kola area. And if actually lo if somebody looks at the uh, Kola intersection, it's a major transportation hub in the sense that it's through traffic, it's local traffic, uh, it's a regional uh, uh, minibus station as well. At the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's a large space that is really in the sense that it is really needed by uh, surrounding communities. So he conducted an analysis at the city scale looking at the potential role of that location. Uh, so it's very much, his project is very much about connectivity, uh, which is really connects to the theme of this project. So connectivity at the city scale, if you look at the top left image, and then looking at connectivity at the site scale. Um, and he actually, <coughs> Uh, you know, through a scenario analysis of what could happen to the bridge of the cola, he had, at the end of it opted <coughs> to bury it under uh, designing the actual uh, train station, uh, the bus station, which is the architectural dimension of this, looking at uh, ecological and landscape analysis, uh, talk engineers on transportation and so forth. And, and again here, you know, we begin to see the mix of tools and methodologies to really begin to come up <laughs> with, uh, you know, with his proposal. Next around. So again, I look back uh, at the projects at the district and neighborhood scales, um, and they are also analyzed in the, same, uh, in the same manner. But as we go down into scale, you know, our tools and methodologies become a little bit more refined. So if you look at the architectural dimensions, looking at the building regulations, for example, the Ramat al project, and looking at setback manipulation, um, at the landscape level, looking at uh, specific ecosystem services, specific landscape processes, landscape history. Uh, if we look at the urban agriculture, uh, Burj Hamoud, again, looking at you know specific soil analysis, which goes under uh, the landscape change uh, analysis, um, and so forth. So again, there is also an amalgamation of tools here that really bring uh, you know, and try to address very specific problems uh, of each uh, project. Next, Aram. So, going down to the site scale, or the, the next three projects are uh, completely landscape architectural projects, where uh, three capstone project students, and if I recall, I think. Um, I think Mahran was also with me on, on advising this group as well. Um, but we had three, three students who actually decided to tackle buildings and try to look at buildings as landscape. And uh, Noor Farhat uh, addressed the Holiday Inn building as, as a monument. And what she did is, if you look at the central uh, image with a lot of lines, little dots in there, um, she actually mapped uh, deaths all, all through the Civil War during the 15 years of the Civil War from 1975 to 1990 and looked at their locations and where their concentrations and this became her theme or design theme to try and look at re-envisioning uh, the whole Holiday Inn as a memorial uh, to the Civil War but at the same time trying to look at uh, uh, using landscape elements basically water, landform, vegetation, structures as a way to reconceptualize uh, the project. So this is still Noor. If you look at the left uh, image, um, you know, these can easily like architectural plans, but they are actually planting plans looking at the different floors and the different subdivisions as landforms that become, become into vertical uh, elements. Uh, the second project by Raya Rize, um, she tackled the old beer factory um, in Ashrafi, uh, beer karmiz, uh, not, not karmiz, I forgot the name of the area. But anyway, she, she addressed the abandoned building, it's an old abandoned industrial building, and she completely tried to 
look at it from a purely landscape perspective in the sense that she she aimed to transform this uh, she aimed to transform this okay Aram got it Uh, she aimed to transform this place into a, a social place, including apartments, including commercial areas, and so forth. But the way she perforated and she created the whole uh, uh, project was very much dependent or based on uh, climatic factors that impact uh, vegetation and planting, uh, at the same time looking at the water systems, um, and so forth. And the, the last project is actually an ongoing uh, 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 a stone cutting factory located in Fashima by uh, Tina Moheb. And what she really wanted and was concerned about here is very much the uh, likelihood or the conditions of the workers as well as uh, the condition of the river that is adjacent to the, uh, to the project. And if you look at also at images, she, she tried to create an overhang or a roof that is very specific uh, as, as, a, as a social space for the workers, but as, at the same time, uh, it is connected to a whole infiltration system uh, and cleaning system uh, that really works with the factory. And she did her analysis at the landscape scale. Even the form and the shape of this structure is very much derived from Farshima landscape. And again, more images that really, if you look at the right image with these different colors, the purple, white, and so forth, these are the colors of the water and the river every time they change the type of stone that is being cut in the, uh, in the again a lot of uh, different uh, different approaches were uh, were, um, were employed in developing the projects at uh, at multiple scales um, i will not really go into i still have i think two more minutes but i just wanted to share with you uh, these four images the two to the left show how the students actually visualize their integrated tools uh, either from landscape or from zoning or from planning or from urban design and to the right also uh, trying to look at how these tools are actually transformed into some kind of uh, design idea or a design image so the last two slides so what if you know you might ask what is so logical about these uh, projects. Um, you know, in many ways, they function at multiple scales. So all these students worked their analysis at multiple scales, uh, you know, region, going from a regional landscape scale um, down to site scale. Depending on the type of project, the, the range was, uh, you know, was, was defined. So it's very much about systems thinking. So this is not about basically what is only the, uh, the, the, the output product, but it was also trying to understand the processes, what's causing matter, what is the cause of things. And trying to look at these interactions and the relationships and understanding them and responding to them. It also, a lot of it is very much about increasing the natural uh, systems processes, either, either coming from the urban design dimension or from the landscape architecture dimension. It very much also integrates the human and natural systems and a lot of the analysis and the proposals talk about a change over time in that sense um, where things actually evolve uh, you know and develop into different things so in in conclusion you know we talk about hybridity of of approaches and hybridity of systems and what i've really learned by, through reflecting through these projects with the students is that hybridity is diverse uh, and hybridity emerges from the needs of different disciplines and hybridity, as you can see, has multiple forms and shapes dep depending on the objective and the angle you're approaching it with. And I truly believe that ecology can be a common platform. And here, we really don't need to take this as a literal idea, but because if you approach it from a planning, uh, a pure planning perspective, landscape architecture perspective, ecology might change. But there's also the fundamental understanding that ecology is about natural systems and processes. It is integrating multidisciplinary knowledge and tools. It's also thinking in scenarios. And for me, which is also very important, it's very much about the purpose. And this is you know, a little bit reflecting on the criticism of landscape urbanism. It talks about the purpose. It ends up being extremely the same across different, uh, different areas. Talking about hybridity, but I also still believe in the distinctiveness of each discipline, because I think each discipline can bring a lot of a lot of uniqueness 
to that hybridity. So what I'm really talking about at the end of this presentation is looking at an ecological base for disciplinary assimilation and trying to de-silo the way we actually think. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Aram. You, you'll stay with us uh, for uh, Q&A in about an hour. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so next speaker is Maria Gabriela Trovato, uh, who's an assistant professor at the Department of Landscape Design and Ecosystem Management at AUB. She completed a PhD in 2003 at the University of Reggio Calabria and the University of Naples in Landscape Architecture parks, gardens, and spatial planning. Maria Gabriela's most recent research focuses on landscape in emergency, uh, the Medscapes project, um, and on the forest and landscape restoration mechanism. She's the chair of the Landscape Architecture Without Borders group at the International Federation of Landscape Architects, she, and she's working with international landscape professors on the landscape in emergency research in special focus, with special focus on Syrian informal settlements in Lebanon. Good afternoon, um, and thank you, Robert, to give us these possibilities today to uh, present uh, our research. And um, this is a research today. I will talk about uh, the um, informal ecologies. Uh, first of all, uh, this title came during a discussion we had uh, with uh, all the team, uh, the landscape department, together with uh, uh, Robert Saliba. And by the end, I discovered that uh, in reality, already there are uh, other researchers that are using the, serm, the, the same uh, terminologies. But uh, why uh, uh, talking about informal and ecologies uh, uh, specifically in, um, in Lebanon? Uh, I will stop one moment on these uh, images because uh, uh, before to start I need to thank you particularly one person that is Rabia Shibli because he was the one that uh, um, introduced me uh, when I arrived here in Lebanon uh, uh, to the topic of uh, migration. I was already uh, researching on that but uh, he, he helped me theoretically but also practically through also the um, uh, civic center here at UB uh, to have contact uh, with the local and to the international NGOs that are working on these topics here in Lebanon. Then it's, uh, 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 I have to, to really thank you him because uh, he, um, it's uh, for him that today I can uh, present to you this research that is still ongoing. Then uh, uh, these are uh, data that I took it from uh, UNHCR and uh, uh, showing uh, the, uh, some data about uh, the migration, the fact uh, how people are moving every day because they are in search of a better chance of life. In reality, me too. I'm uh, part of this migration because I moved from Italy to Lebanon in, uh, in search of a better quality of life. And, but I'm uh, part of a special elite of uh, migratory flow. Um, then uh, uh, what's happened when uh, a lot of people move? Uh, while moving, uh, we uh, transport with us our knowledge, our culture, our memories, and we transform the place in which we locate. And when I arrived here, it was through discussing with Rabia that I start questioning, but uh, what I'm transporting with me in this country? And I have to say that after five and a half years that I'm uh, here in Lebanon, I'm still eating Italian every day. I'm uh, still uh, talking in Italian with my kids, uh, with my family. I'm, um, I feel every day more attached to my country than I was when uh, I was over there. Then uh, it's true. We cannot remove from our memory uh, the knowledge uh, and the identity that it's part of us. Then uh, this helped me, and it's uh, always helping me in understanding uh, the way people are reacting every day when they move. 
and why at the end we face this kind of um, migratory flux that are creating a landscape as self organized territory. But uh, what really tricky me is the fact that uh, by the end, because of all of this it's uh, still uh, not um, easy to control, is that while moving they are creating a lot of uh, misuse, waste of natural resources and abnormal production and uh, of rejection and uh, complaint about the lack of uh, planning of the landscape. Then uh, uh, this is the, uh, one image of the Mediterranean area and I'm really attached to this uh, part of the world. I believe that we, uh, we live in a special place and these are the dots that are related with the measure of the um, uh, migration that is happening in this part of the world. And then a new Mediterranean landscape is in place today. And uh, because uh, uh, they are um, uh, reallocating in new context uh, and they are creating new relation with the uh, structure in which they are locating. And as uh, uh, we know, this flow is creating new geography. Then this is what we are witnessing. Uh, we are now part of these new histories and new geographies. And, uh, and then what's the relation with landscape? Uh, I started questioning myself, but uh, how I can uh, intervene? Which is my role? And I was discussing with my students that I involved uh, in this research, uh, saying how we can contribute. Because it's true, when I started, everything started because uh, of humanitarian purpose. I was not able to stand without doing anything, and only without seeing people having trouble. And then I start questioning, then what can I do as a landscape architect? And how landscape is related uh, uh, to this movement? In reality, it's uh, uh, related because uh, uh, these people, they are moving and they are spy in reality to stability. All of this informality that we are looking at, in reality, it's informal because every day they add a piece to improve what they have, to have at the end something that could look stable but it's not. Then uh, we aspire to stability, but in reality uh, everything changes every moment. And this is landscape. Landscape is always evolving and changing. Then uh, that's why uh, I was uh, looking at the informality uh, and uh, looking especially at the different form of uh, informal settlement uh, uh, because also when uh, everything started in Lebanon, uh, the most struggling things uh, were all of these tents distributed all over the countries. And, and then everything started from, uh, from this. And then why ecology? Then uh, ecology today has come of age. And we are talking, everyone is talking about ecology, uh, urban ecology, landscape uh, ecology, everyone. Then ecology is now central to the vocabulary and language of the contemporary landscape. And how it is related with informal, uh, they are related because they are always using an open system. A system that is never closed and it's always evolving. Then uh, I'm, uh, I, I wrote down uh, some uh, questions that are in reality not mine. I only rephrased because they were really related with what I'm uh, looking at. And then how this uh, integrated planning and sustainable development uh, considers the informal as an active constituent in the ecological discourse, and how informal settlements can engage in the, the transformative processes that make new urban scenarios. Then let's go back again to data that I took it from UNHCR. And uh, 
uh, these are the data and uh, I realized uh, um, uh, while looking because I, uh, normally every six months I, I uh, look again at the UNHCR data and I discovered that the only number of refugees uh, uh, legalized uh, in uh, the region that are decreasing are the one in Lebanon and I, I have no clue why. And, but what is really interesting looking at this data is that uh, the majority, they live in urban, peri-urban and rural context. Then they don't live in informal settlement or in camps. But uh, this is Lebanon and then I put uh, the location of all the informal tented settlement uh, on, the, uh, on your uh, right and on the other side the percentage of Syrian displaced in residential building and these are the numbers 71% in reality lives in residential buildings 12% live in non-residential structures and only 17% live in informal tented settlements. Then um, uh, these are some of these pictures that I collected during these uh, seven years and what is uh, most uh, evident that there is a huge strain on uh, services and infrastructures. Then I try to compare the different uh, typology of uh, uh, informality, uh, looking at the tented settlement, the substandard buildings and the residential buildings. And uh, what uh, at the end uh, is the result that we have a geographic uh, urbanization that is horizontal in the case of uh, the informal tended settlement and they are all over in, uh, ur in uh, agricultural area, then the substandard uh, buildings, they are punctual and they are also spread, then are uh, the geographical uh, uh, context, and the residential building in which we have this uh, high density in a vertical uh, situation. I will go a little bit faster. Then uh, I uh, focused mostly in uh, two uh, area in uh, the Beka, Balbek uh, and Armel uh, governorate in which you can see that the number of individuals registered uh, really increased between 2016 and 2018. And this is specifically the Beka Valley because uh, the, uh, uh, between the total of uh, registered refugees for living in informal tented settlement, 43% live in the Beka. And I compare the presence looking at the UNHCR uh, uh, data, the presence of the tent, and uh, the um, change on land use uh, looking at agriculture in the same area. And uh, specifically, I investigated the Barelias uh, area and Altiliani. It's one of these informal settlements. But if you look at these images, you see the existing villages and these informal temporary villages. This is how I call it, uh, created by all of these informal tented settlements. Then I looked again uh, at the different typology and I saw um, that uh, there are a linear informal settlement with different uh, um, uh, subcategories. Subcategories. There are, and uh, this is how they looks like. And you can, uh, if you travel around uh, in the Beka, you will find it. Then there are the compacted informal settlement. Always, we are talking about agricultural areas, and. We have the uh, scattered informal settlement, specifically in agricultural and greenhouses areas. But uh, what they have in common is that they are enclosed entity. They have no connection with the urban structure. When I say urban, I mean the villages nearby, uh, uh, and they are totally isolated and out of context. The internal distribution this morning, uh, there was a presentation talking about uh, Zahat Arikamp uh, and the handbook, uh, the, the one of UNHCR, because all of these uh, informal uh, tented settlements 
and uh, they are not organized by UNHCR, then uh, they don't abide to the handbook. And then the distribution, it's, uh, it, it's um, uh, this, the tent, they are randomly settled, there is not a, a hierarchy of spaces, public, collective, semi-private, private, private uh, and the internal infrastructure are elementary. And what is also interesting is looking at the borders, because they are spread and there are all of these different type of limits that are uh, now uh, really creating uh, a new landscape uh, all over the uh, rural areas uh, and uh, uh, the level of pollution. We pass it through uh, here in Lebanon a huge waste uh, uh, crisis. Still, we uh, didn't find any solution, but obviously the presence of the uh, Syrians uh, distributed all over the country, specifically in agricultural area, increased the level of pollution because in most of the case they are located nearby agricultural canals, and these are some of the picture of the situation. Then. Um, I looked why also this is happening and I tried to verify looking all, uh, also the UNHCR uh, data, the type of infrastructures that uh, are present in the different informal settlements. Sometimes they have uh, toilets, sometimes they have not, there are kitchens, there are shops, but uh, it depends on the um, settlement. And it's the same also here in Barilia, so I did a special in the Bekaa Valley. Then uh, let's go specifically to Altiliani because uh, uh, back in 2015 we uh, organized a workshop and uh, we did a practical intervent, uh, intervention over there. Then first we investigated uh, this informal settlement. We studied the public or let's say the uh, built versus unbuilt and the different uh, type of borders. And uh, we uh, adopted this methodology, the methodology of uh, observing, interpreting, and interacting, uh, and documenting, recording, and especially engaging with community. And we worked with community. We decided to, to do something inside the settlement for the people living inside. And um, and then we defi we try to define to delineate this uh, methodology uh, using landscape as a flexible relational and uh, creative strategy uh, capable of managing the changing and transformation. And, and these are the three areas in which we intervene, A, B, C, with water garden, child children playground, and pedestrian connection. They are they were really minimal. Uh, I can say to you that we spent less than uh, $500 to implement all the project. But uh, uh, what was really important, uh, we really um, discussed a lot about the sense of community, because uh, this is the most struggling part. People uh, forced to live together in a place, uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that they will create a community. They, they will live together, but uh, they will never create a community. Uh, this is what happens over there. Then uh, we didn't force this sense of community, but we tried to establish some connection using the space, the open space, and try to work with the singularity instead of the complexity. And these are some of the pictures of uh, yes of the um, uh, work that we did. And what uh, the most important thing is that uh, uh, we went there after uh, one year after, and this is what they did without us. It means that uh, they uh, we share something at least uh, we uh, we um, uh, gave some uh, strength uh, to them to say we can do also without. Uh, uh, or with uh, uh, really um, small things. 
Then this is another project we did with the students. Uh, uh, some of them are here in Sarafant, but uh, will go really fast. And also over there, we adopted the same methodology. We did implement anything because we were not able to implement it, but we checked uh, again at the sense of community, privacy versus um, public safety and all of these things. And uh, to conclude, I want to uh, now stress to the residential building, uh, because if you look at these images, uh, the majority of residents uh, uh, living in residential building are in the Mount Lebanon and in the south. And especially, I will go to this building that is located uh, in Ansaida, and uh, that um, uh, was uh, uh, um, uh, to become a campus for a uh, uh, university. And then it was transformed in, uh, uh, let's say, a village for Syrians, because there are um, between 900 and 1,500 residents living over there. And uh, uh, this is how it looks like. There are four floors. There are some uh, services because there is a mosque that uh, they were uh, building over there. Uh, there is a playground and an NGO created uh, on the um, uh, ground floor. The, there is a school because there are NGOs working with them. It looks great, uh, but there are a lot, a lot of uh, um, uh, issues over there. There is a lack of infrastructure starting from water, electricity, electricity, sanitation, but uh, also simple things as doors and windows. And when we went there, they were just uh, building uh, and constructing uh, windows and doors for uh, this building uh, uh, using the rooftop. And, uh, and it's interesting uh, because uh, instead of having this uh, uh, population spread all over, in reality, they created really a village, but uh, in a building. And also all of these families, they come from the same village. Then in this case, we can talk about community. And uh, what really is interesting and uh, what I looked at, it's always this human action uh, that shape uh, the ordinary everyday life. And there are still children playing and 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 then we have this landscape knowledge that is still transported and there is the concept of place and how important is the concept of place as a source of uh, security and identity as i mentioned at the beginning and um, and then i i want to uh, and i will go faster because i want to reach this point and these are some of the problems, but I don't want to say that. Then uh, there is this, uh, let's say, risk landscape, but uh, we are not prepared for that. But what can we do? And, and then I, I tried, I say, you know, I'm a landscape architect, I can propose to do, uh, to reuse the, gro the roof and create uh, uh, food production over there. But is this what they want? Is this what they need? I'm not sure. I have not a real answer. I said that at a certain point when I did, uh, started this research, I stopped because I was so overwhelmed and I was not able to got to uh, any point uh, to have any answer and then what is important is uh, that um, what uh, I'm doing now uh, I was lucky I became chair of a landscape uh, uh, um, uh, architect without borders that is a group under International Federation of Landscape Architect <laughs> this is giving me the possibility to spread and to work together with other people and other landscape architect researchers and also geographers and people that are interested uh, in uh, working uh, in a um, uh, situation uh, with, uh, where people are in, uh, in need. And then it doesn't mean uh, not only um, people that are migrating, but people in need. And, uh, and we are trying to work together to achieve and to spread uh, the role that uh, landscape architect can play in this situation. Because we can help government, we can help community, and we can also, as a researcher at the university, we can um, uh, uh, help our students in have awareness about the uh, things that we can do. And I want to finish with this uh, uh, um, uh, sentence of uh, Zygmunt Baum. 
I don't believe there is a shortcut solution to the current uh, refugee uh, problems. Humanity is in crisis and there is no exit from that crisis other than the solidarity of humans. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maria Gabriella. So the next speaker is Naila Al. Uh, she's an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the Department of Landscape Design and Ecosystem Management here at AUB. She's the co-founder and administrative member of the Lebanese Landscape Association. Naila has worked on a number of landscape architecture planning and urban design projects internationally. Her research, interests, her research interests lie in the interactions between humans and their environment and in the role of urban greening in transforming underutilized spaces into multifunctional landscapes that promote both human and ecological health and well-being. Naila, the floor is yours. So thank you, Aram, and uh, everybody here for having us. Um, I'm going to take you now to a much more smaller scale uh, and a you know more specific topic in landscape architecture, but in also in uh, urban design. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about urban ecologies blurring boundaries between public and private uh, spaces. So we often hear the sentence: uh, the availability of accessible and attac attractive green spaces is an integral part of the urban quality of life. Um, but in the density of Beirut, available and open green spaces are very scarce. They are often hidden behind concrete blocks uh, and often they are remains of an older, much greener urban fabric. Um, looking more closely at these spaces, we start to identify green patches uh, that show a variety of textures and sometimes even a network of, uh, of, of these green spaces that, start, that are starting to connect. If you look here, it's not one space, right? It's a series of private spaces. Some of them are highlighting, uh, you know, private spaces of tall residential buildings becoming, you know, uh, playgrounds. Others are highlighting entrances to residential areas, private gardens, leftover spaces, and abandoned sites. And all of these are parts of private, uh, of private landscapes. But what they, these generally have in common is the protection of walls, barriers, and limits of the private property, which officially or unofficially officially have either kept them uh, preserved throughout the years or introduced them as new urban ecological islands, small and immediate, and part of a larger network of informal green spaces. What you're looking at here is a, a is work done by LDM to 22 students, uh, uh, done actually last semester, uh, studying urban green spaces in the area of Ashrafiya and Sodeco. And mapping urban green spaces, we realize, and if you look at the legend to, uh, in the middle of the uh, slide, that most of these green spaces are actually derelict and abandoned green spaces. We all then have 27% are institutional green spaces, 14% are residential, 11 are parking greenery and basically par uh, greenery uh, in parking lots. 10% relate to churchyards, cemetery and cemeteries. Uh, and then 5% uh, or so are streetscapes and then you have uh, kind of building entrances and uh, and uh, informal, uh, you know, uh, extension of, indoors, uh, of indoor spaces. So what we're starting to notice is that the majority of these spaces are private. And it's very important to, to know that when we look at cities like Beirut. And so the students looked in more detail at these typologies. They tried to identify their, char their characteristics further, what made them special, what changed, uh, what changed between them. So they had a variety of different sizes and shapes and characteristics and values. Uh, but one thing was clear is that most of them, if not all of them, uh, promoted ec uh, climatic, ecological, social and aesthetic values in the urban fabric. And most of these private spaces had high values from an ecological and social point of view. So the conclusions we took out of this was really that uh, private spaces and private landscapes were everywhere, in small areas as well as in large spaces. They constitute large proportion of urban green spaces and a, ma a major part of our experience with nature within the urban fabric. They are a diverse, heterogeneous and uh, bring a variety of benefits, but mostly and more importantly they are uh, of high value because of their proximity, because they are extension of, of our living con uh, environments and because they are easily accessible and uh, places that we are exposed to on an everyday uh, basis. So, you know, when we're looking at these specific landscapes, it's somehow 
sometimes tricky to associate specific values uh, with specific typology. And even more so, it's sometimes even trickier to understand what is private and what is public when it comes to these values. So if you're looking at the, street, the streetscape, for instance, you know, a lot of the uh, mood, the character, the identity, and the memory of the space will actually come from private spaces along that street. Uh, but does that mean that these are not part of the street landscape? Uh, so these are questions that we started to look at. And I mean, this notion of, you know, borrowing from one space to the other to create that experience is not new, right? So the notion of the borrowed landscape uh, has been there for a long time. We've seen it in the borrowed scenery of East Asian gardens in the 17th century. We've seen it in England, English gardens of the 18th century. We've even also seen it in some modernist architectural works in the 1960s. But what I'm trying to say here is that what I'm proposing to do is actually to flip the view. So basically, uh, uh, what I'm saying is not to take the large territories and the common grounds as part of the private landscape, but rather uh, to look at the private landscape as a constituent of the common ground and the common experience. And so this is what these spaces started to tell us. And again, we're looking at different scales, right? But we're also looking at who benefits from these. Is it the public or is it the private? And where do they stop and where are their limits? So in order to promote this idea a bit further, I'm going to look at three typologies. The private garden, the mall, and the cemetery. All three important spaces within the city of Beirut. And I'm not saying by choosing these three that really our lives are, you know, simply simplified uh, to the notion of dwell, shop, and die. But what I'm saying is that if you actually take these three typologies together, uh, you'll c find quite an interesting understanding of the city landscape and its urban and social ecologies. So starting with the private garden, uh, notions of stewardship, ownership, and values really start to take shape. Um, the private garden, you know, is an important uh, uh, space because with urban population growing, uh, there was a lot of pressure on this typology of green spaces within the city. And we've lost uh, a lot of these types of uh, um, urban landscapes. But private gardens are often seen as luxuries. Uh, and it's important today to understand and define their role more precisely. Uh, it is also an important to highlight their values and what, uh, where, where they have as a unique role to play within our urban context. Um, there are significant differences in both form and management of domestic gardens, which radically influence the benefits. And as we're going to see here, I'll take you within the next uh, slides into a series of understandings of what private landscapes are about. And so if we look at the more traditional garden, uh, you know, this is a garden that sometimes people might look, might say it looks messy, uh, but actually, as Nassauer mentions, me messy uh, ecosystem, m uh, messy landscapes are actually very highly valued ecological ecosystems. Um, the notion of the old house provides relatively a large proportion uh, of green space relative to the house, meaning that it promotes better climatic condition, insulation of the house against temperature extremes, better cooling, and a haven for habitats. Um, generally, it is less managed, meaning that it is more ecological. And often within these spaces, gardening uh, is promoted as an environmentally friendly pastime, allowing bio biodiversity and low use of pesticides and the the idea of acceptance of a more messy landscape and more bio, uh, bio, biodiverse landscape. It also means that often we will see uh, uh, an acceptance of uh, cultural planting of fruit, fruit trees. And for those who know, fruit trees will be uh, attractive for high biodiversity and habitats, especially birds, bats, and, sp uh, and other types of species. Now, the difference between these different private gardens will depend uh, heavily on ownership, uh, and those related also to the notions of care and stewardship of these gardens. So depending on the ownership uh, and how much control a resident has over this garden, uh, we will start to identify different uh, benefits and values. Notions of front yards and backyards also start to take place when we're uh, investigating benefits of these gardens. And actually in places like these, where th these are considered as backyards, uh, you will start to see much more personal interventions, much more biodiversity, much more uh, uh, variety in selections, and much less management and maintenance. While front yards, uh, which happen to be an expression of basically what we consider as respectful gardens or respectful entrances to buildings rely much more on highly maintained, uh, less archaeological, high-valued uh, lawns within the private spaces. Now, 
I'm not trying to uh, say if this is bad or this is, you know, good. But what I'm trying to say is there are a variety uh, of uh, values that happen with these different aspects of ownership and stewardship. The higher buildings, uh, especially ones that uh, allow a variety of users to come together, become much more of an extension of the uh, outdoor space and the community life. Especially if, such as the case of this one, the private building is owned by a family, meaning that extension of family life uh, extends all the way to the garden, Front yard and backyard are often uh, blurred, uh, so the boundaries between these places are blurred. And you know, uh, activities such as sports uh, and uh, kids' areas become, uh, you know, major spaces and events within this um, within these spaces. Now. Again, depending on ownership and the residents uh, characteristics, the approach to these landscapes will change. So for instance, with this one, the reliance is heavily on tropical plants, high maintenance, high irrigation, but it also means reliance is not on use as much as enjoyment from the indoors. So basically, the design of this uh, beautiful landscape is more for kind of relaxing while you are indoor. Okay, while others start to look more at uh, biodiversity and and uh, planting design in its details and is meant to be discovered from the outdoors, pushing people outside. And so these notions, you know, uh, going from the kind of the, uh, uh, the uh, to, uh, you know, the small uh, park to kind of multiple story buildings to high rises, we start identifying a shift with the relationship with nature. So with high rises, we start to see these green islands at the front yards, often related with lawns and a lot of water features that are there just to be perceived and seen but often also separated from the common environment, meaning they are put on a pedal stilts or behind a wall. Uh, and basically the, the only interaction becomes one that relates to the immediate space relating to the, to, uh, to the residents, often very limited and you know sometimes uh, very systematic. So if one person such as this one decides to do something different, it will automatically appear. Um, even places where you know the idea of landscape as architecture so basically as a system not really about the material the ecosystems and the plants but more of a certain patterns within that architectural piece and a continuation of that architectural piece starts to uh, be highlighted now we with high races, I think it's important to look at the ground floor uh, because often the ground floors end up being uh, uh, vehicular spaces, mainly for cars. And if there is any landscape feature, it's uh, generally about you know the majestic entrance, the the lawn, and kind of the neatly pruned uh, vegetation. Some might not be surviving very well; other uh, just suddenly became artificial. Uh, but really, I think the notion of water becomes very important, and that is also a very important has very important value for biodiversity as well. So as we as we can see, a variety of pro approaches to, prop, uh, to property, to intent, is very important. But the notion of the barrier here becomes extremely interesting. So while some places hide uh, their, their indoor environments, others extend them out. So these are uh, conditions where you know the landscape extends beyond the private property, not just physically, but also visually. So a lot of places, transparency start leading, uh, leading the um, uh, the public uh, user onto the private property, uh, questioning whether it's private or public, extending indoor and outdoor spaces with no gates and barriers, and also uh, physically starting to uh, to try and break this uh, clear limit between the inside and the outside. The idea here, however, is really these spaces are critical today. So when you have these, uh, you know, in between spaces that remain, uh, you know, as part of the public but also part of private, it is important to estimate their values, to understand what they can offer to the city to better promote a healthier life. So when we go to the mall, the second larger uh, kind of um, uh, private landscape, the mall today has become an important object and destination point in Beirut. And you know, while often perceived as an artificial island, an object disconnected from the city, recent literature has been investigating is, its role as an urban entity that promotes individual and societal well-being by offering restorative experiences or restorative service scapes. And I'm not talking about shopping as a restorative 
restorative activity, I'm talking about exposure to nature. And so if we look at some of the most famous uh, uh, shopping centers, we start looking at planters, right? So vegetation within planters uh, and, and uh, limited entities. Uh, a lot of them rely on tropical plants, so highly maintained and very majestic sculptures. And you know, while they're meant to become barriers to, to separate spaces, actually, uh, you know, biophilia with the notion of people attracted to nature and the need to nature uh, comes in. And so even with, you know, little artificial insulation, you start attracting kids that look at these planters at adventurous forests. Um, however, what was more interesting to me was the development of these spaces. Uh, so looking at uh, you know, our latest uh, introduction within the shopping mall realm, and I have to say that the perspectives do not do it justice because as you see in the perspective, it's um, highly reliant on these artificial, uh, you know, tropical plants, while in reality, vegetation is much more natural and much more present within these spaces. So again, if looking at these spaces and in looking at the notion of environmental psychology and the attraction to nature, what is being offered here is really this notion of prospect refuge, the notion of uh, nature protecting you from the others, but also providing you a space to hide and overlook the rest of the activities. And so, you know, you can see it everywhere, indoors and and I have to say that, you know, bamboo is also starting to become much more uh, sustainable in its use. Even the larger bench where people sit is where you give them vegetation on, one, on the same bench. But here people are starting to be immersed in nature. The character is changing. The types of plants are varying. So they're using more native uh, plants. They're using a variety of species. They're accepting messy ecosystems. They're also promoting uh, agricultural and productive landscapes with the citrus trees, as you see here. They're uh, they're uh, accepting temporality and changes within the landscape and also seasonality and fascination. So, so, so shop owners really understand the value of landscapes within these spaces. And they really become hideaway from city life. They become fascination points and attraction points. Uh, they also become, uh, you know, entertainment uh, facilities. And I'm, you know, I was, uh, you know, shocked to see that kids were allowed to take all of I take up all the gravel and throw it in the pool and the security guard was saying nothing while my camera was almost uh, you know removed from my hand during take while taking these pictures um, uh, but also I think it becomes really accessible space and it creates a community environment so the safe security guard who was very strict in the beginning uh, you know, stopping people from throwing uh, bread into the pool became part of the fans of the fish pond at the end of the day. So finally, I would like to talk about the last, uh, I'll try to conclude very briefly uh, because I've, uh, I've taken too much time. So basically the last uh, space I'm going to talk about is the urban cemetery. And I think a lot of you only know the cemetery from the aerial view. So basically you've seen it because accidentally you happen to be in a building. And the reason because of that is because often cemeteries are hidden by high walls. So they make them, you're unable to see them from the street, but you're also uh, unable to imagine them. So, so um, often they become voids within your minds, but also within kind of the urban fabric. And we have to understand that we have more than 26 urban cemeteries in Beirut. And I'm sorry, I'm going to go very fast around these. And they come in different characteristics and ecological values and social benefits. But what you need to know that if you calculate these spaces and compare them to pro public urban green spaces, they will provide you up to 56% additional urban green spaces in the city. And the importance and significance of this is twofold. One is ecological, the other is social. So looking at these, it becomes a place of conservation, place of conservation of memory, of history, of personalities and people, and social classes and social hierarchies within the city, memory of an old landscape character and an old uh, nature that was today lost within the city, but also places of bereavement and social places where people come um, uh, uh, basically uh, to, to, uh, to connect with their loved ones uh, and leave plants, create certain new ecologies, new biodiverse uh, landscapes that are often uh, very minimal to maintain. So these are very natural sites, unmaintained and with high biodiversity. And mostly they are conservation sites for native species that sometimes you do not find, such as the case of this one. So you have to understand that soon these species will be extinct and cemeteries are the only conservation sites available for them. Um, and as we talk about conservation, I really have to talk about conservation of well-being because cemeteries are only some of the few open and large green spaces allow, uh, you know, provided by the urban, to the urban residents. And so 
to conclude, I think this notion of the private space needs to really be investigated uh, further, uh, not just as a private lot, but as an urban uh, landscape system. So the notion of the barrier will need to be investigated much more, not just as a, as a, as a separator and crea the creator of an urban void, but also as a protector, a place that separates the living from the dead, but also that separates people from uh, other species and allow other species to thrive. It's a place where we need to look at the details, uh, uh, not just to map all the ecological layers, and this is also an exercise we did with our students uh, last semester, trying to understand ecological values within these private spaces, but also create networks within these. So once you look beyond the, the, the scale of the lot and start to map them in terms of habitats, patches, and ecological systems, and try to link them and look at the flows of species, the fragmentations and connections that they create, and the potential that they have, only then will, I think, will be able to rethink the edge, rethink the barrier, and try to see how these private landscapes can start playing a bigger role in our urban environment. Thank you. Thank you, Naila. So the next speaker is uh, Miran Madani. Miran holds a PhD in, in interdisciplinary design with specializations in the social production of urban landscapes. Dynamics of Physical, Social Well-Being and Healthy Community Design for Aging Populations, Design Health Solutions for Resilient Urban Environments, Innovative 2D, 3D Visual Communication and GIS Data Modeling. He currently teaches at the Department of Landscape Design and Ecosystem Management at AUB. Miran has published several articles and book chapters and is the recipient of numerous prestigious academic awards. I'm, I'm using this. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your time joining this panel. Uh, I'm going to uh, propose a paradigm slash hypothesis. Uh, I'm not act, uh, expecting you to accept that. Uh, still is not generalized. Uh, but uh, it's good to start and create a discourse for uh, the term that I call it social conservation based on the expansion of uh, uh, suburb infrastructure and suburbanization. Um, I'm giving you some first uh, uh, like reminders and uh, ideas based, uh, based on the current uh, theories and then how I'm uh, coming up with the, the emergence of social uh, conservation and uh, what's the use of that. Uh, first, as I uh, explain how uh, I, I'm going to build up this uh, uh, hypothesis uh, according to uh, conservation and the emerging uh, and connection and integration area of uh, suburb neighborhoods, uh, I'm starting with the Heidegger's uh, uh, quote what's happening as negotiation between uh, boundaries, between two uh, entities uh, and uh, the, the age of uh, uh, interaction. And um, just as a reminder for urbanization uh, that I consider it inevitable phenomenon. And uh, uh, I, I believe if uh, I considering uh, urbanization as a problem, also I believe is a problem, uh, if we uh, apply an appropriate form of, I mean urban form, and form of ur urbanization, we can have ecological and sustainable uh, urbanization. And uh, as you know most probably, um, now more than half of the pop world population lives in uh, urban areas, and also by 2050 we are uh, expecting about 70% of that population. And uh, uh, just in 1950, we had one megacity over 10 million population, and now we have more than 23 cities, and they are growing. Um, two main theories that I'm going to explain uh, uh, to make a base for uh, my hypothesis. First, uh, I'm taking the principles of um, uh, new Urbanism, uh, Congress for New Urbanism, and uh, uh, the founders, probably you know them, uh, Andreas uh, 
uh, Duani and Elizabeth uh, Zybert. Uh, they uh, started the idea in uh, the 80s with the support of also a very uh, um, iconic scholar, Peter Kaltrop. Uh, um, uh, and um, the other movements also started uh, based on smart uh, growth, urban uh, growth management, and also healthy community designs. And they, they are offering some, uh, like, 10 commands for a new uh, urbanization, the form that we are considering based on uh, higher walkability, uh, green uh, transportation, higher density, and uh, quality of life, and so on. Uh, they also believe that uh, um, those uh, commands and principles for new urbanism that they is based on the traditional neighborhood development. They call it T uh, T N D, and not uh, transit-oriented uh, development. Uh, they uh, and as I said, they believe. Uh, these kind of uh, principles are taking the urban forum to uh, benefit uh, residents and uh, businesses, invest investors, and also the cities. Uh, they also have, uh, as you see, these books are, uh, are offering ideas not for only new developments, also the issues where they are concerned for the existing uh, urban forms. Uh, and mostly I'm talking about uh, uh, suburban form. And the other uh, theory, and somehow they are claiming it's a discipline, even landscape urbanism, uh, as uh, probably you know, uh, was created uh, based on the thesis topic of uh, Connolly in uh, mid-90s in Australia, and then in early 21st century, uh, very uh, prominent uh, scholars uh, from prominent schools, Charles Waldheim and um, uh, James Corner and Mustafavi, Harvard and uh, Pens uh, Pennsylvania uh, University and University of Toronto, uh, they developed and promo uh, promoted the idea. Also, Pierre Blanche was part of their team, and um, uh, what they offered as uh, the best way to design cities uh, is just designing. Uh, uh, based on their landscapes rather than uh, designing uh, based on buildings. And um, they also believe that uh, uh, landscape urbanism is based on adoption of the city culture and adaption of the landscape to uh, what is uh, needed, uh, what's needed for that urban area. Later, uh, Pierre Blanche branched his theory based on landscape urbanism, or uh, sorry, uh, based on landscape infrastructure or landscape as infrastructure. And he believes any kind of uh, infrastructure uh, from buildings, open spaces, uh, in, uh, waterways, green patches, and um, uh, transportation in infrastructure, including uh, um, airports, uh, roadways, and uh, bus terminals, they are part of a system, different layers of a system that um, although we call them now uh, urban uh, infrastructure, he believes it takes us to a very mechanical form of infrastructure and very mathematical form. And um, uh, we need to re redefine the uh, the definition uh, of, uh, of urban infra infrastructure. The, the first, with the, this, this uh, assembling that and then reassembling uh, the definition, getting to the uh, also some background of urban dynamics that in his book he's against the idea of um, adding dynamics to uh, industrial to urban towards uh, the way he's presenting the idea of uh, Jay Forrester when he started the idea late 60s and early 70s uh, with computer simulation of 
dynamics. He, uh, he believed that with a computer model, he uh, showed how a uh, central part of the city can uh, stagnate and decay uh, after a while and uh, need more resources uh, for, uh, and that's why we need the expansion going to uh, suburbs and beyond the urban uh, uh, growth boundary. Uh, and the, the way he is uh, uh, seeing the, uh, the systems, uh, urban or world dynamics, he believes in a closed uh, system. And uh, it's very interesting, after uh, uh, publishing those books, his students published a very famous uh, book, uh, The Limits to Growth. And uh, 30 million copies of this book uh, were sold in 30 languages in the uh, mid-70s. And uh, they promoted the idea of closed system again based on the, um, the computer model for uh, simulation of urban system. How was the interaction of human being, human system with their environment. And a few years after that, uh, uh, Howard Adam came with this book uh, adding the idea of open system to urban ecosystem, the way that we, we can uh, bring uh, a self-organization uh, idea to design, and, uh, to design uh, um, a more um, efficient system uh, with uh, uh, in, in, uh, maximizing the power of uh, humans uh, in controlling the environment. And uh, um, Pierre Blanger is uh, following this idea uh, as the, uh, bringing the open system uh, notion to landscape of infrastructure, or he, call, uh, he calls it a landscape as infrastructure. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, he believes that landscape uh, uh, um, infrastructure based on also the previous scholars' theories like uh, Patrick Getty uh, thinking about synthetic uh, thought of the regional city, that he, he was uh, not against the uh, so, uh, urbanization based on not seeing uh, urbanization as a negative uh, impact on the nature or natural re resources. He was accepting that uh, based on um, uh, the, the, the flexibility of that through uh, urban uh, complexity. But uh, also his uh, student, uh, Louis Mumford, was, uh, al although he was accepting those ideas, but he was critical about uh, um, suburbanization, the way not only because of uh, the low density uh, and lack of social activities, he was very critical about uh, uh, the, the costly form of infrastructure and also the transportation system in uh, suburb uh, neighborhoods. Anyways, um, related to what I mentioned about uh, uh, landscape urbanism uh, and uh, uh, landscape as infrastructure, Pierre Blanche believes that uh, landscape infrastructure can offer more ecological approach to uh, the urban eco uh, ecosystem and is more flexible to, uh, to adapt the culture of that, the, the uh, urban area. That's why I'm, uh, I'm applying those ideas to what we consider now as urban form, as you know, um, just uh, reminding us the uh, definition of urban form based on accessibility, connectivity, land use, and um, also diversity, density. Uh, the way we are uh, using land form, it's, uh, it's the way that we consider how uh, we are shaping our urban environment. And uh, what we uh, what I'm uh, focusing now is mostly about uh, 
uh, suburbanization, suburban form, the way that um, uh, they started as a trend after the Second World War, uh, and you uh, probably know about Levittown as uh, like initiation of that, uh, that trend, and uh, now there still is ongoing as gated communities or suburb uh, developments, but not as a trend. And um, when we have uh, expansion uh, or growth of uh, suburb neighborhoods, we, uh, we are facing urban sprawl. And um, urban sprawl has its own uh, negative points, and we have books about uh, those concerns, and also this uh, uh, book with the three uh, famous scholars from public health, uh, epidemiology, and also urban design uh, and, uh, land, and architect, uh, architecture field. They are uh, bringing up the issues with health and how um, suburbanization is causing uh, n neighborhoods with less walkable areas and also less physical activities and uh, as, as uh, uh, an outcome, uh, lower uh, quality for uh, well, social and physical well-being. Anyways, I'm uh, getting the idea from both spatial and social, the way that I think, uh, things. I, I believe, although uh, suburbanization has its negative points, and I'm also against that trend, uh, if we assess the, uh, we assess different dimensions of uh, suburbanization as social and spatial, uh, especially for uh, spatial geography based on the location of, uh, spatial location of human beings and uh, the environmental elements and their uh, relationship, and um, the way uh, we and the, the way they are connected uh, with the, based on their activities, social geography as a, a subject for human geography, and the way that social phenomena uh, and their spatial characteristics are related to their uh, spatial, uh, uh, this, uh, this spatial uh, characteristics, and uh, not only the hori uh, horizontal uh, connections. Also, we are thinking about other dimension of uh, their relationship. Uh, and uh, then I'm getting the idea from uh, uh, Paul Knox, social production of the built environment. Uh, what I, I believe in uh, uh, conservation phenomenon, when uh, we have the expansion of the physical uh, settings and uh, those uh, uh, suburb neighborhoods, then we are dealing with not only the production of the space that uh, Laferb is mentioning, when uh, conservation as uh, a term uh, created by Patrick Getty in 1915, uh, he was uh, he, he was coming to this idea based on the new technology and modern life, how it's uh, giving the opportunity to people to expand uh, their urban uh, area and their communities. And uh, it, the, ori the origin of this idea goes back to my experience uh, when I used to live in Orange County. Uh, I really didn't see uh, any city among those uh, three, four uh, cities in that uh, county, no difference between Anaheim as uh, uh, co incorporated uh, late in late 19th century and Aliso Viejo incorporated in late 20th century. We didn't have any downtown in any of those cities other than Santa Ana, just not to me, not actual downtown, like a factual downtown, just main, just a main street. And the way they are connected, for instance, when I, I used to live uh, uh, on uh, Jamboree Street, across the street was uh, Tustin, and uh, my zip code was uh, Airwine. And uh, 
one block uh, further was uh, Newport Beach. I was shopping in one city, I was working in another city and living in the other city. But it was very interesting, other than your zip code, you do not understand uh, where do you belong to. And I believe that's exactly what was happening. Uh, the conurbation based on the growth of those suburbs. But uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, also we can test what is happening uh, on the border of those uh, suburb neighborhoods. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm uh, just showing a space syntax tool, the way that we can understand uh, when they merge, when the, those suburb neighborhoods are merging, how uh, conurbation is impacting the, uh, the physical environment, and also how social environment is shaped. I mean, when uh, they are growing, we have uh, more uh, opportunities for people uh, to walk on those uh, dead sidewalks and uh, use those uh, empty open spaces. When we have uh, more uh, population density and the unit density, then it's uh, uh, not the uh, space production. It's not only based on uh, conurbation phenomena, creating new spaces. I also believe uh, what is happening there is production of the space as uh, uh, public life and uh, daily life of people. And w that's why I'm coming with this uh, uh, hypothesis. I, I believe uh, social conurbation related to the existing theory of uh, conurbation is uh, happening in between uh, when uh, suburb neighborhoods are merging and uh, there are more dimensions and factors coming together, spatial and social and um, uh, what we have as repairs to uh, suburbanization or sprawl uh, not only those uh, uh, solutions are uh, working now, I believe suburbanization is Improving, Im improving itself by uh, our true social conservation. And uh, uh, I believe it's, a, um, it's good to start this discourse maybe later if uh, we test the, uh, the hypothesis, it can be generalized. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Miran. So could the panelists please come up front? We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Um, so if there are any questions, please could you present yourself, uh, your name and what you do, and then uh, eventually uh, pose a question, and then who is it addressed to? Hi, my name is uh, Ziad Raya. I'm an urban planner. Uh, my question is directed to Naila. Uh, I'm private green space is nice, I think, from a, you know, you know, visually and so on and so forth, but I do not find a real use value for the city. Uh, and you mentioned that in uh, the malls that there are accessible spaces, but I rather feel that these are only accessible, uh, accessible by a certain social class, and what Beirut itself specifically really needs is um, integration of more public green space, municipal gardens, a rehabilitation of its uh, um, ecological systems and uh, waterways. Um, yes, I think, you know, when I started doing this research, this was the uh, position I had. Uh, and I am still in the position uh, of saying that Private green spaces are not here to replace public green spaces. I think this is the first notion we have to understand. I think what this, what I was trying to do is investigate the potential of private green spaces for what they are. And I agree with you the notion of, you know, the certain, this aspect of the social class and the malls and, you know, open spaces. But I think green spaces are highly connected to social class. Uh, and a lot of literature and studies has looked at 
the the conditions, uh, you know, social, economic, and uh, academic, or basically education levels, are highly related to amount of green spaces available in the cities. So that that is has been proven by literature. And by no means am I saying that private green spaces are here to replace public green spaces. I think this. I think we need to understand. But when you talk about not understanding the value of private green spaces. I think the notion is, what are values of public green spaces? So let's start by identify, identifying values of public green spaces um, and not try to copy them within the private green spaces. That's also another thing, which comes into the, the, the notion of not replacing. Uh, and this is why I went to urban ecology and environmental psychology, because I didn't want to look at this from an urban design, from a landscape, you know, social point of view. I wanted to look at it into the disciplinary fields to investigate new values of these spaces. And I think this is what allowed me to start looking at the values from other fields, not from our conventional approaches to these private and public. And, and the idea is to remove the notion of private. And I mean, at the end of the day, the aim is to remove private and public uh, from the landscape language when trying to identify values, especially because ecology is not about private and public. So the boundaries of private and public don't, the, private, the boundaries between country and region are not applied uh, to ecology. And I think this is what I was trying to investigate. Thanks. Hi, I'm, hello. I'm Eduardo Rico. I, I'm a PhD candidate in UCL and I direct landscape urbanism in, in the AA. Uh, and obviously, I'm, I'm going to ask questions related to, to landscape urbanism in this I mean, I've seen a number of comments on, on LU, sort of the way it was being thought about in, in the US, that was much more of a response to uh, suburbanization and de densification. And then, at some point in time, other lines of LU research started to, to take place, answering much more about fast growing sort of like strong formal necessities of of emerging economies such as china and india and i, and I think i've seen some Im images in some of the presentations about the work we carried out like three or four years ago in india uh, but in a way there was a flipping point in which lu was not necessarily about suburbanization it was more about block growth architecture like density and in a way part of that discourse filtered back into gsd some years ago. So I'm just wondering how you see that, that movement of, uh, of treating landscape as a way of, of finding density back in the city fits into this entire discourse of suburbia. Like, uh, you know, how, how do you think landscape was feeding the formal project away from the initial stages of, of, of Walheim's stock in Detroit and into this other uh, more I would say, at least at some point in time, focused on emerging or growing, sort of like a super, growing urbanization or countries where they're suffering strong growth of cities. How, do, how does it fit into the suburban or on your, the agenda? Um, uh, as Yasser also mentioned in the first uh, presentation, but some comments to landscape urbanism. Although uh, I was uh, uh, although I was uh, uh, working also close at least for two years with uh, Charles Walheim and uh, Pierre Boulanger at the University of Toronto, uh, at that time it was very interesting that uh, it was a very uh, new uh, idea and still it was not based on uh, making that a discipline. It, it was just they are uh, holding they, they were holding some uh, conferences inviting James Corner and Mustafa. They were coming to University of Toronto uh, to promote the idea. And the way that at that time there was like very controversial uh, uh, idea and uh, not still the theory. They they were working on that. But what I have, uh, what the issue, although I uh, I talked about the, their uh, principles and their perspective and the, the model they are making, but still I, do, I have issues with landscape architecture, uh, landscape uh, urbanism in, as uh, another discipline uh, emerging from landscape architecture uh, 
do, I do not still know if they are considering landscape, or, uh, landscape, landscape urbanism as a discipline, as a, a, a theory, or as a style of design. Because they have projects like Highline Park as a, a landscape urbanism sample, and if we, even we say as a, an approach to uh, a, the theoretical approach to uh, the actual design project. But I do not know. Uh, you mentioned about the discipline of landscape urbanism and you, AA, they are, uh, they, they, there is a discipline, right? Uh, but still in the US, they couldn't make it as discipline. They, they are not often, although the, the, ma the main uh, scholars are there. The, the funders are there. I mean, not funders as the original funder, but as uh, the theory funder. Uh, but um, I do not see also the way they are uh, saying, we are accepting and uh, adopting the culture of uh, the, for instance, suburb. What you are asking about how landscape urbanism uh, uh, can, uh, can uh, improve the issues we have in sub suburbs, right? In suburb neighborhoods. Uh, uh, the, the way, if, if you accept the culture, okay, the culture of, uh, uh, the culture of Orange County, a lot of cities in, in the US is suburb culture. How we can adopt a, a suburb culture but come up with landscape adaption to solve the issues? How, how really we can solve the issues? Uh, the, the, the way that I, I um, transfer that to the idea of conservation as a, a, a retreat and a, a improvement for suburbanization, I'm saying so, uh, if we let them grow and they merge, they, they uh, cure themselves, suburbs. But I, I'm not sure how landscape urbanism can solve it based on the, the core uh, uh, theory that they are saying we are adopting the culture. If we are adopting culture, it's the culture of suburbs. Uh, uh, okay, I, I was not yet very clear about your presentation because I think at the end I, would, I was not able to understand what's your hypothesis, meaning that you, you introduce us to the literature that uh, actually is, is uh, you are basing your, uh, on this literature to, to formulate a hypothesis, but I was not clear about this hypothesis. However, I would like to see the, uh, you know, to say that <clears throat> there is still in your thinking a lack of acceptance of suburbanization on its own terms. You still, you are still searching for centers in the suburbs. And there is another point of view which is to accept the suburbs as they are and to actually start from their culture rather than impose on them uh, this, this notion of center and periphery. And I think that this lack of acceptance <coughs> is, is, you know, at the center of your discourse. Uh, there is something else also that I would like, just a remark, is that since this conference is about <coughs> architecture and urbanism, I would like to note that both new urbanism and landscape urbanism were theorized by architects. Okay. Right. So, so it's it's really great, you know. So, architects actually are not only theorizing the city; they are theorizing the landscape. <coughs> They are theorizing your feeds, actually. But Pierre is not. And, uh, and also, what's, what's great that the three of you are architects who move to. Uh, you are a geographer, no? No, I. Uh, environmental design. Environment, okay, so the three of you are actually 
architects, environmental designers who are moving to actually to landscape. So my common question will be, I'm very satisfied actually that ecology is being theorized by architects. So uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a revenge, but the point here is that it's a golden opportunity for me, I think that, you know, in this panel, that how you as architects uh, um, could reconceptualize this connection between architecture and urbanism through landscape. And this is what, you know, it's, it's, it's a little, it's here about intersections, intersection between three disciplines. And one intersection that I found very interesting is Naila's intersection. And I would like to, because she linked building typology to open space typology in the city. And so that is this link between typology of the building, typology of the open space, and the relationship of this open space to the public. And I find what's really interesting that she was able to uh, focus on her subject because she was able to put on the side this dichotomy between private and public that we are engaged in all the time as planners and architects, okay, private and, and, and public, and she answered, you know, the question in a very straightforward way when a planner asked her about how do you engage with the public, what, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Naila, she said that the public space, actually, the private space is connected to social, uh, 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 actually, uh, to, to social class, okay? So, uh, this way of, of seeing is, is what I call is a realist assessment of what we have, of, of what's there. And if we start of uh, just liberating ourselves from this social segregation, private and public, we can start opening new perspectives like the research that she has done uh, with no excuses actually what i what i like uh, you know that her 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 uh, uh, presentation was non apologetic you know she was not apologizing at all that she was dealing with the green space in the private realm it's part of the reality which is not your case because you are still feel guilty you know, that this growth is not linked to a social, uh, you know, coherence, and in the same time, it does not reflect this idea of, of uh, you know, inner city social relations. Uh, I was, to you test know, your I, I was <laughs> not able to, right. I'm sorry, I was saying I was not able to see your presentation. But to test uh, your is, uh, hypothesis is, yeah. I, I, and uh, make it generalized, is uh, good to get the empathy. That's why first you start with the humble way of this is the way that I'm thinking and uh, related to the literature you are getting the support. If you get the feedback that at least some positive feedback if you can go you can test it and if it works that way then uh, it gets the theory. That's why uh, the case it was not uh, the actual project that I'm talking about. It's very theoretical. And if I apply it to public uh, space, public place, actually it's very interesting that conservation gives us the opportunity when uh, those public spaces are more active. And uh, as I mentioned in the uh, uh, space syntax, we can test it when we have more connections to the main street and. Uh, more and higher den uh, unit density and population, dens uh, population density, then we can turn the, those public spaces to public places and neighborhood, those suburb neighborhoods, to urban communities. Why do you want to turn urban communities into suburb? suburb no, no, suburb. suburb. Because of the issues that we have. The, the, the issues that I believe still we have in suburb areas. That's why still I'm, I'm against suburbanization. That's, uh, that's the guilt that you think uh, comes not fully support my hypothesis. Yeah. Um, I would also like to add something. Um, 
I mean, I was uncomfortable with the notion of private, public, and private. And um, and again, uh, I think for me, it was not about questioning the public, but really understanding that we can no longer discard re, uh, discard the private, especially in uh, in our days where green spaces are very scarce. But I want to go back to what Robert com uh, said. You know, having a background in architecture, I think the only way for me to be to be comfortable with kind of blurring the boundaries is not thinking of them in the first place. And this is what, uh, the, the only tool I was able to do that with was to get out of my background of architecture and immerse myself in ecology and psychology. And, and I think as an, and, and this is where I would go back to say that no, I did not choose my background. I had to force myself to, to, to fight my background in architecture to be able to dissolve this notion of the boundary. And I think this was a very important step. And this is why I think that talking, using different disciplines and working with interdisciplinarity is the only way to come up with new visions uh, and not to remain you know, uh, within the boundaries of our own fields. So this. Uh, I want to say something about the fact that uh, as architects we move to landscape again <laughs> because um, I think for me it was an added value, it's still an added value. I believe I'm an architect first and uh, the way and why I moved it's because uh, at a certain point I, feel, uh, I felt I was uh, enclosed in something that I, I was not able to um, uh, to control, you know. It it was too fixed, and uh, and that's why I, I was also talking about informality because I I strongly maybe for my personality, I strongly believe that there is this continuous movement, and I was not able to uh, to deal with this movement while doing architecture because it's really fixed. You do an object, it's there. And it, uh, you have to destroy it. And why landscape? It's always in movement. And it's something that's changing. It's al always evolving. And I don't feel there is a kind of, um, uh, um, kind of contrast in between the different disciplines. I believe that uh, uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, merging together because uh, uh, what I learned at architecture, it's now helping me in understanding landscape and the different uh, perspective in which space, it's not only the fixed space as uh, uh, they taught me, and it's something um, more complex than uh, uh, this notion of uh, looking at the space on the different uh, angles. It's uh, helping me in having uh, a better uh, overview on the uh, space and, and also, uh, let's say, an I don't want to consider landscape also as a green because it's it's not also my uh, point of view. I, I believe landscape is really holistic uh, and it's uh, how we as human we interact with this space in general that could be green, that could be city, that could be everything. Then it's it's it, it's over there that the the, the uh, different disciplines they come together architecture, urbanism, and landscape. I feel that in this moment, urbanism uh, is facing a, a lot of crisis, and we are not controlling uh, uh, a system that is always evolving, and, and the law, the regulation are so strict that, uh, or they are not existing, that by the end, um, we cannot control it, then I feel that with landscape that is more flexible, we will be able to create a common ground in which architecture and uh, um, uh, a new form of urbanism can uh, live together. Okay. Um, but this maybe it's my personal uh, I, I, Excuse me, please. Uh, we're close to, could you, do you have a short question? Yes, please. La, oh, oh. Appreciate if you can make it yeah. short. Okay, I just wanted to pick a fight with Robert and say that <laughs> I agree with Mr. Madari's dislike of the suburbs. Hi, Robert. Uh, because you said, why don't we accept it and start from the culture, or I would say lack thereof, because I don't think there's a specific 
something called culture in the suburbs. Just to tell you that I, my opinion, and you know, everybody has various opinions, is that the culture of the suburbs is something that's imposed because the beginnings of the suburbs had nothing to do with urban form. It had to do with the car culture, with real estate development, and a very healthy dose of racism. The blacks are moving in, let's move out. So there's a lot of things. So although I commend that's very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean Suburbicon. Has anybody seen Suburbicon recently? So I like the idea that you know you are trying to find forms <laughs> to deal with them, but I think the solution may not be only physical. Unfortunately, okay. the solution may be a number of things, the least of which could be the physical aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry. Time is time is up. I would like to thank the panelists, the four panelists, uh, for very interesting presentations and the audience for a very interesting discussion.